let's talk about the process. We'll just jump into the milestones and hurdles and uh, lead us to, which will lead us to the dissemination. So we talked about the process a little bit. Let me get into it a little bit deeper. The research question, again, the question that I'm trying to answer, is it going to be based on a bench study, a, again, a petri dish, an animal, or is it going to actually involve humans or a clinical trial? The first thing I'm going to do is I'll have a question. Now, the researcher may have a question, or a drug company may have a question, or someone may just have a question. So the question comes from somewhere into a researcher's hands, and the researcher says, okay, that question needs to be answered with this design. So once they get the design, they're going to write up the proposal. Within the proposal, which is the, the preliminary protocol, what, what the steps they're going through, they're going to write that up, and it's a very long, uh, somewhat boring document that hopefully you'll be able to uh, read through a little bit better after today. Once they get the proposal, the first big hurdle, well, the first big hurdle is actually writing it up. So the second big hurdle is something called IRB, Institutional Review Board, which is also medical ethics. You may hear of different ways that they call this, but in general, IRB, Institutional Review, means that there is a review board that looks at the uh, ethics the, of and the safety of the study. And every university that does research will have an IRB. Uh, some uh, research facilities that just do research, they have their own IRB. Um, so the research has to be, if it involves human subjects and even animal studies, it should have IRB type of approval. And to be published in a journal now, every journal requires you have IRB approval for a human study, human subjects study. And this is the, 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 the hurdle that you have to wait for because these groups only meet like once a month. <laughs> and they have to go through five or six studies as well. So there's another subgroup that have gone through the, the review process to make sure that it's ethical, that you've treated the patients well, that there's a, not a huge risk of harm, those types of things. That's the purpose of an IRB, is to look at the protocol and make sure that it's safe. Then, generally, they go through funding. Now, they may have funding before that, but if I'm funding a study, I'm waiting until IRB. I'm not going to give them a bunch of money and then have IRB go, no, I'm not doing that. So generally, um, the funding can come at the beginning, but, it, but generally they'll, they'll get their uh, approval from someone at, uh, at an IRB and then uh, go for funding. Then becomes the recruitment process. Remember I said that can be anywhere from uh, one day to two years, depending on the type of study. Um, the testing and intervention, the analysis, and the dissemination. A little bit more about the uh, IRB, just to protect the welfare uh, and the rights of the human subjects. Okay, that's what this is. There's something called the Helsinki Declaration that was written up many years ago that kind of serves as the framework for the IRB. So what you're going to see, you, you usually see this in a proposal, um, would be all of these documents that talk about consent forms and rights and HIPAA and all those kinds of things. That's all of the IRB requirements. And generally, if you see that it's been approved by IRB, you'll see just a letter saying this study has been approved by IRB for this time period. Then, then you know that it's already been reviewed and ready to go. But that's the first question that we want to ask is, has IRB approved this study to make sure that it doesn't violate rights? Now, the funding, again, generally it depends on who's funding the study. If it's um, in NIH or, or the FDA, really important for disclosure. Disclosure is a really important word, particularly for me. And since I work in, in, in industry, and I'm also a clinician, I'm also a patient, when I'm in industry and I'm supporting a researcher, they have to disclose the support of my industry. That's another source of bias, okay? Everything about reading research is about being able to identify the bias that's in the study that may affect the outcomes, that may have some type of effect. And bias, obviously, if a company sponsors a study, that can introduce bias into the study, meaning that may be the results, may be more favorable for the industry-sponsored research. Now, that does happen sometimes, and that's why we have to disclose. And if we disclose, it's just a limitation that we have. Generally, as a scientist, if I read the, the methodology, 
and I understand it, and it looks great, and even if it was funded and it has a positive outcome, I'm okay with it. You'll be surprised to see, and I do this with my industry, if there's a negative outcome for my research that I sponsor, I don't care. I publish it. You know, or I tell them, I never withhold publication from my sponsored research. Because I tell my researchers, it doesn't matter if it's a good or bad outcome. Obviously, a good outcome for a company is great. But a, a negative or not a, a, the outcome I'm looking for is also great information for the consumer and other scientists to know, well, you shouldn't do that. Okay, so, so if, if I showed, for example, um, that my TheraBand exercises uh, were not as effective as um, taking a pill or something, which would never happen, um, I would still say, yeah, good, don't use that product because this one works better. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually helping my customers, my patients, by saying, don't waste your time doing something that's not going to work. Try something else. Okay, so a negative or a, a, a non-positive outcome for an industry-sponsored study um, is, is, is okay because it adds to the body of knowledge. But you have to know, you have to be able to look at who's paying for the study and just understand the bias. But if the science is good, the science is good. There was a study that I read. There was a, 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 a product on the market just last week that... Uh, was looking at pain relief, I think it was. It was, a, it was a pain relief study. And it was published, I think, in the Journal of Pain a couple of years ago. And it was actually like the owner of the company had written up a, a truly an observational report saying, I put this product on the knee and their knee pain went away. So it works. <laughs> What's wrong with that study? Uh, obviously, it's biased towards the, you know, the owner. And he was, or he or she, I don't remember, at the end, you know, in full disclosure, they were owner of the company or whatever. But what's wrong with that design? So they claim that it relieves knee pain. It, it did relieve knee pain, but was it the machine? How do you not know it was? What, what, what was missing? What do you think caused the pain relief? Was it the machine? What could it have been? Placebo effect, that's right. And they didn't even acknowledge that in the entire paper, which I knew was biased because the owner of the company wrote the article. So I was mad at the journal for actually publishing that. Okay. Now, I don't know if I'm talking about this, but there's something called predatory journals out there, just letting you know. Nowadays, I get emails every other day from a journal saying, please uh, send in your paper for publication in the Open Journal of International you know, Bone and Joint research. Okay, they, these are people that are journal mills. They charge for publication. What they're doing is they're actually, they're usually based overseas. Okay, and they have this obscure name that sounds real scientific-y, and it's all online. It's open access. Anyone can do it. But once you go in and say submission, it's $2,000. Mm -hmm. But they'll publish it for you. So a friend of mine, we, we, we always have fun with these people. So a friend of mine got one of those, and he says, okay, well, I'm going to submit an article that I had when I was a student that got rejected, you know, and it's a terrible science paper. And uh, so he says, okay, I'll submit it, and it will be uh, peer-reviewed and those kinds of things, which means it's reviewed by another group of researchers. Within 24 hours, it was reviewed and accepted, <laughs> and with a bill for $2,000. <laughs> he said, you can keep your money. I'd that just proved my point. So there's, um, there was a, a great article that actually listed these predatory journals. Um, and I, I put it on my, my Twitter. Um, I'll show you the Twitter address if you want to see those. But you'll see the names. They sound really scientific-y, but they're really not that good. So there's a lot of information that's being published online in predatory journals that um, are not really accurate. And so even if the publisher you know, or the, the author may be an owner of the company or have that bias. And even if it's, it's probably bad science to begin with, but they'll publish it because they're looking for the money. So be careful of any information about from these types of journals that you don't know about. It's very simple to find out if what we call is something's called the impact factor. The impact factor is the level of impact that a journal has. 
which is typically based on the number of references that it gets from other journal articles. Um, and there is some manipulation there as well. But the big names, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, you know, those are big things. But be, just be a, a better consumer of journal articles. I'm the, I'm the geek that goes back to the bibliography and looks for the reference all the time. Okay? And you'd be surprised, a lot of times those references are from textbooks, which to me are not a reference. <laughs> textbooks are supposed to use references to begin with. Okay, uh, back on track. So uh, the funding for, for research, where does it come from? Obviously from uh, industry. Mine was funded by the NIH. Um, universities have research funds as well. Patient groups like AAMDS will put in money. Um, and others as well. So there's a lot of funding opportunities, but it's still very hard to find, and you've got to match the interests. Okay, so AMDS is not going to fund a study on physical therapy for rotator cuff tears. That's just not the way it works. A pharmaceutical company is not going to provide research necessarily for a drug that it's not even manufacturing. So we have to link up where these opportunities exist for funding. As a researcher, I have to be able to know where to find it. And in order to do that, I, knew how, I have to know how to apply for a grant, okay? Grant writing, I took, a, I took a whole class in grant writing, if you believe that. This is a very specialized art, is how to write a grant to get the funding that you want. And it, people, are, um, people have full-time jobs just as grant writers, okay? So this is the rare disease paradox that I was mentioning a little bit earlier about how much it costs to do research and the fact that rare diseases, is there any money to be made in rare diseases? Not economically, no. So I'm asking for a million dollars, and yet my disease is one in a million. Actually, aplastic anemia was three in a million, right? So I'm asking for a million dollars for three people out of a million. So the drug companies are going, that's not going to work. Now, where do they put their money? heart disease, cancer, things that everyone's going to get. So 50% of the population has cancer or heart disease. That's where they're going to invest their money. So, and they'll even make up things to make more drugs for. Uh, my favorite, opioid-induced, uh, what is it? Opioid-induced constipation. Oh, if you have OIC, which the drug companies basically make up, to treat the side effect of another drug, which we know opioids are the biggest evil right now, which leads to even more problems beyond the drug addiction. Uh, for just the, the opioid goes into heroin, and you know, there, we, have a huge, we do have a huge epidemic. But why are we paying for a constipation drug when we have opioids that we shouldn't be using in the first place? Right? Um, so there's the problem. This is what Dr. Townsley told me. You know, she was saying, the reason why it's really hard to do rare disease research is because there's not a lot of funding from pharmacological companies. So AMDS and, and smaller groups have to come up with the money, and PCORI, they have to come up with the money somehow to fund these, and that's why NIH is so important. That's why they, they focus on the rare diseases, because no one else will. All right, next step. So I got my proposal, got it through IRB, I got my funding, now I have to figure out how to get the patients. Again, this is the most important, most difficult part of our research, is how do we get the, the subjects. So if I'm doing a rep, uh, an obs observational healthy study, very simple to do. I recruit students in college, give them points for going to the study. That's why, if you mem remember, if you went to college and you were in psychology class, they're doing ex psychological experiments every day. You're getting tons of points, all these kinds of things. But if I'm looking for patients that aren't in college, that are somewhere else, I have to advertise. So that's where clinicaltrials.gov comes in. Um, that's where places like AAMDS um, provide information on, on um, studies. And there are also research companies that have little standalone buildings that usually um, cooperate with farm, pharmacological companies to do research in their little uh, mall office there. You go in for a research test, or you may hear on the radio, hey, if you have knee arthritis, call this number and we'll get you in a brace study, uh, those types of things. So we have to advertise, maybe in the paper, you know, those types of things. Okay, once I have that, I've, 
I've got to have specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is an important part of getting that representative sample. So you want to have a sample that represents, obviously, your population. And you want to have samples that have pretty much the same characteristics. Remember that if I have two groups that are totally different, they, the, that one group may be biased towards another. So I have to look for a representative sample and use these criteria to be sure that I'm not including people that may add bias to it. So if they've had experience, you know, one of the big things with exclusion criteria is if someone's had the, another treatment, that may in, introduce bias to it. So I have to exclude anyone who's had another type of treatment. Or in, sh in shoulder research, um, I have to exclude people who may have shoulder injury if I'm looking at a healthy population. So those inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria also include age, um, the diagnosis. Now recruitment, again, as I said, may take years. And the sample number, the number of people that I have to recruit is based on what we call statistical power. So the number of people that I have in a study Obviously, phase, remember I showed you phase one is less than 100, phase two is more than 100, phase three is like 1,000. That's the first you know, number of sample that you might need. And that will obviously dictate how long it's going to take to do the study. Now, statistical power tells me if I have enough of a sample, enough people, what we call the N, the N size, N equals the, the sample number. So if I have an N that's large enough to be able to detect a difference. Okay, what does that mean? So the statistical power gives us the ability to use statistics to make that inference that there was, a, was or was not a difference between the two groups. So a under, you may hear an underpowered study means it had a low sample size. Underpower means there were not enough subjects to be able to really reliably make the conclusion that there was or was not a difference between the groups. And the statistical power is calculated before, it should be calculated before the study is done. And there's a formula that you plug in, and it's based on the statistics and the variability within the populations. Okay? You, again, don't need to know all that kind of stuff, but power gives us the ability to reliably um, determine if there really is a difference between the groups. And a lot of times, an underpowered study will not find a difference between the groups. As we're going through our recruitment process, we have to have something called informed consent. Informed consent means that the subjects are informed about the study and that they give you consent to participate in the study. This is a huge part of, of clinical research, and it's a huge part of the Institutional Review Board because it has to do with your rights as a patient. And the big parts that we look at in informed consent are that you're volunteering. You understand you're volunteering. No one is making you do this. You understand your rights, your risks, the benefits, and you understand that there is confidentiality within this. So all of these have to be included in informed consent. Now, when we're doing studies on kids, which we see a lot with bone marrow failure as well, that the, the um, when we look at the, the children, the parents have to get involved. So they don't have informed consent, they have informed pos, uh, permission, just another terminology. So the kid doesn't sign it, the parents have to sign it, and, and they understand all of the rights, benefits, risks, and all that kind of stuff. That's what informed consent is. So back to why it takes so long. This is the process that I just kind of went over on a timeline. So. Um, Looking at, this is the month, 24 months. That's pretty typical for a clinical trial to take two years. Because what I was saying was the IRB and the approval and all that, that's going to take two to four months already. Okay? Then we have to go through enrollment. As I was saying, based on the number of uh, subjects, that's a year. could be a year. And what happens is the study is ongoing for a year. And the subjects, every time a subject comes in, they enter at a certain point. Now, the study itself may be a day, it may be a year, or whatever. So it's not just about the enrollment. I still have to do all of the follow-up stuff as well. So even your last subject will still have an additional timeline for the study. Okay? So once you're recruiting, you're always looking at, uh, the, for in this case, it was questionnaires, but it could be the intervention, it could be the, the collection. Sorry, I got out of the picture again. 
Um, and then as we go through and we, we put our, our subjects into the, the trial, we have to start entering data, okay? And the data analysis lasts a little bit longer after the last patient, uh, the data entry, and then the analysis, it keeps going on and on until then we have to write up the paper. And it, it takes another month or two to write a paper, believe it or not. It's hard work to do that. We, so we send things out. So once I, get, if, once I get my data analysis, the good part about writing up the, the, the manuscript um, is that, and I'm also the editor for a couple of journals, um, what, what happens is when you write the manuscript, um, luckily you've got your proposal, which is a lot, uh, unfortunately, cut and paste. So I can take a lot of the information that I've already done for my proposal. And that serves as kind of the introduction, um, the methods, and the, uh, then I do the data analysis, and you do results and conclusions. So the, res the discussion, results, and conclusion, all of that is what I'm writing up afterward, okay? And I'm putting it into a good coherent type of format. So being a good researcher is also being a really good writer. That's an important part. And then you have to pass it around all your co-authors and hope that they actually look at it in a timely manner. And then once it's ready to go, then it has to be submitted to the journal. And once it's submitted to the journal, that review process can be anywhere from one month to six months, depending on the backlog of the journal. And it may not be published again until two years after it's actually been accepted into the journal. Okay, so there's a huge push right now about this access to data. So we're looking at potentially you know, a study that took two years to do takes another two years to get published. So how does it get disseminated? That's what the power of the internet's done for us. It's actually given you um, really early access to things. You'll hear the term, and I mentioned earlier, open access. Open access means anyone can freely get it. But you know, if you go looking for journal articles, how hard is it if you don't have a subscription to that journal? You gotta pay $35 to get that, okay? And that's a big problem. Some of them are open access, but a lot of these big journals, they don't, they, they're there for money. That's the bottom line. And so you rely on PubMed, okay? You go to PubMed, you hopefully read the abstract and you get the information that you need out of it. But that in itself can be really difficult to not just read an abstract, but then to know what you're looking for and how to find it on PubMed.